Greetings, First Christian Church, Bonner Springs family and friends and guests. I'm Rick Jordan. It is the weekend of September 12 and 13. Joining me in the sanctuary are Dick and Dot Espy, Connie Henry, Leanne Detar Newbert. You'll also be hearing from Pat Manahan during this worship experience. We have an array of prayer groups, Bible study groups. They're online right now. And if you are interested in checking out one of those through Zoom, we're providing the link for you. We're also providing a link to our webpage just in case you're inclined to give through that portal, uh, the link is there for you right now. Each year in the life of First Christian Church, September is Stewardship Month. Uh, this year, I've decided to call it Stewardship 2020, the Home Edition. Thank you, Pandemic. But we are moving ahead with our stewardship emphasis, and we're going to be talking about manna from five different scripture passages. Sharon Bracken has decorated the table with something that really looks a lot like manna. I mean, I wasn't there when manna happened, but I, I think it looked something like this and felt something like this. So thank you, Sharon. Our first scripture passage is Deuteronomy 8. And all of these scripture passages will be in the faith exercise that we provide for you. Moses says, Be careful to obey all the commands I am giving you today. Then you will live and multiply and you will enter and occupy the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey God's commands. Yes, God humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. God did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone, Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Our second passage of Scripture comes from John chapter 6. And we pick up in the middle of the story in verse 22. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the far shore saw that the disciples had taken the only boat and they realized Jesus had not gone with them. Several boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the Lord had blessed the bread and the people had eaten. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went across to Capernaum to look for him. They found him on the other side of the lake and asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, you want to be with me because I fed you not because you understood the miraculous signs. But don't be concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of His approval. They replied, We want to perform God's works too. What should we do? Jesus told them, This is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one God has sent. They answered, Show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And then one more. Acts chapter 4, describing the early church. 
Verse 32, all the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. There were no needy people among them, because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. For instance, there was Joseph, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi and came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. That was a mouthful. It will make sense in just a few minutes. Following the sermon, Leanne will be leading us in communion And we want you to use whatever elements you have on hand. We are disciples of Christ, a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. As part of the one body of Christ, we welcome all to the table in the same way that God in Christ welcomes us to the table. As Connie plays, let's prepare our hearts for worship. Let's pray together as one family. Jesus, our manna, we meet you here as one family in worship. In every time and every place in history, people have always needed you as Redeemer. Whenever people are oppressed, they're hungry for you, and you are the answer to their needs. Everywhere people struggle with the inevitability of sickness and disease and death and and heartbreak. They are hungry for you and you are the answer to their needs. At every point in history when people have searched for meaning and significance, they have been hungrily searching for you and you are the answer to their needs. Hungry hearts of this harvest are ready for you, Jesus, to show them the way to future and hope. We praise you, Lord, our living bread. You are everything we need. We praise you that we are given the Holy Spirit in abundance and that all our needs are realized in you. 
We pray this in the authority of the name of that gift, Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. When I was 20 years old, I was a junior in college. Carla and I had just gotten married. We were living in Bolivar, Missouri. I was called to pastor Oak Grove Baptist Church near Lebanon, Lebanon Missouri, out in the middle of the Ozarks. This church was very Ozarkian. They had just installed indoor plumbing before we got there. Until that time, they had used an outhouse. This church had services on Sunday mornings and Sunday nights. Carla and I could not afford to drive back and forth twice on a Sunday. So following morning worship, one of the church families would host us for lunch. We would hang out there for the afternoon, and then return to church for evening worship, and then we would drive back to Bolivar. These are folks who basically ate what they either grew or shot or pulled out of the water. I was a source of entertainment, even more than Carla, because whenever we would sit down at one of their tables, they would not identify what we were about to eat until after we had eaten it. Then we would discover that we had eaten something called head cheese, like the head of a pig, the face of a pig. And then there were the Rocky Mountain oysters not going to say a word about that. But they took pleasure in watching the look on Carla's face and the look on my face. We wanted to ask, what is it? What is it? What is it? But that wasn't the rule of the game. Turns out, the question, what is it, shows up in the Bible in the passages that we are looking at. 
Exodus chapter 16 and Deuteronomy 8, among other passages, tell the story. God had delivered a group of people called the Hebrews from Egyptian slavery. They had been slaves in Egypt for hundreds of years. They had been in the wilderness for a little while. They were hungry and they started bitterly complaining and they were working some revisionist history into their complaining and saying to Moses, we had it so much better back in Egypt. Have you ever practiced revisionist history yourself when you look at what really were the bad old days, but now you're thinking them as, that they are the good old days compared to present reality? So they were complaining. God fed them with manna. In the Hebrew language, manna literally means, what is it? The, the Hebrew word can actually be this, a question mark and an exclamation point. In other words, they were asking, what is it? And God was replying, that's exactly right. That's what it is. Manna was miracle bread wafers provided by God to God's people out in the middle of the wilderness. It was flake-like. It resembled morning frost or dew, very much like what Sharon has put on the table. Manna was sweet. It tasted kind of like honey wafers. It was incredibly versatile, maybe like tofu. It could be boiled, it could be baked, it could be eaten raw. So on any given day, you could have manna burgers or manna tetrazzini. If it's Mexican food night, you could have manaritos. If it was Italian night, you could have managetti or maybe manicotti. I could go on, but I'm not going to go on. So five mornings a week, they would wake up and they would find, what is it, covering the ground. And it was enough for everybody to take one day's worth because it only lasted one day. Now, on the sixth day of each week, God told them to take two days' worth because of the Sabbath, the day of rest. And on those days, the manna miraculously lasted twice as long as it did at any other time. The quantity of the manna was always precisely sufficient. People who didn't need much received exactly what they needed. People who needed more received exactly what they needed. Maybe you've already guessed, manna was only good when God's people trusted and obeyed God with this manna. When God's people jumped lanes, by going outside of God's instructions, taking more than they needed, the manna rotted before their very eyes. When God's people tried to stash the manna, it rotted before their eyes. The purpose of the manna beyond nutrition was to teach people that God was the one taking care of them and that they really, really, really could obediently rely on God day to day. So for 40 years, God sustained Israel with this heavenly, what is it? Are you picking up on God's economic system? Are you learning anything about what the economy looks like when God is manifestly present? God's economy looks like equality. 
God's economy looks like balance between the haves and the have-nots. Now we're going to jump all the way into the New Testament, the Bouncing Baby Infant Church. I, I read that passage in Acts chapter 4 describing what life was like in the early church. Everybody had everything in common. People who did not have much, people who were impoverished, suddenly had enough. And you heard it when I read it. They had enough because the people who had more than they needed shared what they had. In this case, the daily provision from God was their love for one another. Their love for one another became the manna. Again, are you picking up on God's economic system? Are you learning any, anything about what the economy looks like when God is manifestly present? Equality, balance between the haves and the have-nots. And then we're going to move back to John chapter 6. And we were there a few weeks ago. We talked about the feeding of the 5,000, including women and children, maybe 20,000. Jesus took a little boy's lunch and miraculously fed thousands of people. And immediately after that, they had a quick business meeting and voted to take him by force and make him their king because they didn't have electricity, they didn't have refrigeration. They were literally living day to day, but they knew this guy. <laughs> they knew this rabbi who could take a little boy's lunch and multiply it, and, and they wanted to keep him around. And so Jesus escaped. He sent the disciples ahead of him across the Sea of Galilee. In the middle of the night, he walked across the water to them, and then they landed. Well, the, the people had seen the disciples leave. They hadn't seen Jesus leave. And so they were, they were trying to find him. And they crossed the Sea of Galilee, and there he was. And in that back and forth conversation, uh, they were on a physical level. Jesus was on a spiritual level, and he was trying to elevate their perspective so that they could see that it wasn't just all about feeding them physically. It was about feeding them spiritually. Jesus identified himself as the bread of life, manna for our souls. A few moments ago, when Leanne led us in the model prayer, did you catch that one phrase? Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily, what is it? Give us this day our daily bread of life. So putting all of these scriptures together, what we learn is God provides for us with mysterious creativity. During Stewardship Month, I have the honor of each week reading a report from one of our, what we call them, the five G's. Uh, last week, we heard from the Glorify team, Sharon Bracken, and today we're going to hear from the Go Missional team, led by Leanne Dittar Newbert, and this is her report. And I want you to listen as I read. I want you to listen for God's provision through people, God's manna. Leanne says, The seven-month shutdown has brought our church family unique opportunities to show care and concern for each other and our neighbors. We have learned how to worship, to, we have learned how to learn and worship together, meet and problem solve together, and pray in both need and gratitude together in an online forum that many of us have never even thought of using. Hmm. Manna online through Zoom. 
Before every outreach event, the Go Missional team encourages the participants to wear their name badges that displays the person's name and the phrase, reflecting the love of God. On the reverse, we are asked to contemplate two questions. How is this activity demonstrating the kingdom of God on earth? What about my service in this activity can help someone move one step closer to Jesus? First Christian Church has been moved in a mighty way to minister. We donated $4,000 to the school supply fund supplying two grade district wide, two grades district wide with school supplies. And I'll add, when that began, we set the ceiling at $2,000. And all of a sudden, in no time, God had provided through people's generosities nearly $4,000. We delivered 765 boxes of fresh fruits and veggies and 510 gallons of milk to our neighbors in need, each with a blessing prayer attached. That was God's provision through the Department of Agriculture's um, project where the semi-truck would pull up in the parking lot of Christ First Ministries every Thursday afternoon and food would be distributed all over the place. We hosted an American Red Cross blood drive yielding 30 units of whole blood that will save 90 people's lives. Sounds like manna to me. And we anointed every school building in the district and prayed for teachers, staff, and administrators individually by name and then sent each one an email saying we had prayed for them. Our mission to bring each person we come in contact with one step closer to Jesus is being realized. We are deeply grateful for the opportunity to be Jesus' hands and feet. We have demonstrated the love of God in four church-wide projects and many individual ones. We also responded in force to the opportunity to feed our neighbors suffering with the economic turndown. In partnership with our sister church, Christ First Ministries, we delivered 765 boxes of fresh food and dairy, 510 gallons of milk to our neighbors at Von Trent, Von Dale, Mercy and Truth, both trailer parks and individuals, many who went on to share further with their neighbors. That's literally true. We would deliver to some people and they didn't need everything that we delivered and so they would deliver to some of their friends, some of their family members. Doesn't that sound like Acts 4? First Christian opened its doors to the American Red Cross for a blood drive that yielded 30 units of blood, saving 90 lives. Most recently, 11 prayer warriors prayed for each teacher and staff member of each one of the schools in our district. An email was sent to each one, letting each know of the individual prayers that were offered. I have nothing to add to that. The manna is all over that report. God provides for us with mysterious creativity. See, we're not called to figure out God's provision or try to keep God's provision to ourselves, we are called to follow Jesus, the bread of life. We are called to let the bread of life provide what we need as we need it when we need it. We do nobody any good by hoarding or stashing what God provides. God's economy is enough for everybody. And God lets us join God in that manna action. I want to go through our faith exercise. Uh, you're going to be asked to read those biblical passages and then over a seven day period, live day to day recognizing God as your whole life provider and intentionally relying on God as your whole life provider. Next, observe how this way of life shapes your financial decisions, your spending, your saving, your giving. Next, observe how this way of life amplifies your gratitude to Jesus, the bread of life, the one who gives us this day our daily bread. Next, according to these passages, what words would you use to describe God's economic system? How does the economy work? 
when communities cooperate with God as provider. Next, talk about this faith exercise with at least one other person. And then last, I found an excerpt from the Renovare Study Bible, and this is what it says. How God chose to feed the people was unexpected. The way God worked to help them did not look like anything they had seen before, yet they trusted it, ate it, and lived. We also must be prepared for God to work in unusual ways in our lives, like manna. We must be careful not to turn away from something because it appears odd and unfamiliar. Many times, God does something and we say, what is it? Only to find out it is the very thing we need. Amen. As Connie plays, let's prepare our hearts for communion. As usual, you may use anything that you have there with you to represent the uh, bread and to represent the cup. There's a choice that each one of us has to make every time we approach the Lord's Supper here. We have to decide whether or not we are going to politely think it's a ritual that we do every week, or that it is a ritual that happens before the very face of Almighty God. 
Communion is the physical sign of God's abundant provision. It's the love that does not judge or condemn us, but the love that saves us. The cup is the symbol of his blood shed for us. We know that from the Old Testament, the shedding of blood was necessary for the forgiveness of sins. The bread is the symbol of the body given for us that we might be nourished spiritually and deeply. For those who believe, there is no condemnation in Christ. Communion is not just a pair of ingredients used in a ritual. It is the reminder of our Savior's unconditional love for all of us who believe in Him. We are gathered as one family at the table. Let us examine our hearts before God. Pray with me. Almighty God, as we approach this table, which is familiar to us, help us never to take it lightly. Help us always to have an encounter with you, the God of our great provision, each and every time we remember you in the, symbol, in the symbols. We give you thanks for Jesus, who was willing to display his love so lavishly upon us to die on the cross. And as we take these elements, Lord, Help us to recommit ourselves to sharing the great provision that you have given us with all we meet in the honor and in the name of Jesus, the Savior. Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. And after the supper, he took the cup. And he said, take and drink. For this cup represents the new covenant in my blood. Now for our closing benediction, if you have found some of the good bread of Christ here this day, then don't hesitate to share it with others. For this is the bread that increases more as it's given away, and it nourishes us best in the presence of service and selfless giving. Go on your way in good spirits, for the best is yet to come. The grace of our Savior, the love of our Creator, and the friendship of our Enabler be, will be with us this day and forevermore in abundance. Amen.